The Levo SL of 2020 vintage cut its teeth in the South African suns. But in the three years since the launch of that bike, the specialized team have worked hard to evolve their lightweight flagship trail bike. But there's so many component parts, it requires more than a couple of people to do this. After all, an EMTB is more than just a motor and battery. So if you've ever wondered just what goes into creating, to making one of these Levo SLs, well, join me behind these doors to find out. Wow, look at it, so beautifully low key, yet so utterly full of trouble. And when I say trouble, I mean out on the trail. This bike is capable of some serious riding. But guys, come and join us on a tour around the Turbo HQ and some of the key people behind this bike. Marco, so great to be uh, back in Switzerland and the new Levo SL, another part of the story of, right. of Turbo, right? I mean, you must be happy with that new bike. I'm, I'm actually super happy about it because we, uh, like once again, we changed the game and adapted everything we wanted to change and it came out really good. Yeah, so uh, what I want to talk to you about, I mean, obviously you're the main man when it comes down to system engineering, right? Now, when we talk about system engineering, we're looking at the motor, the battery, the remote. There is a charger, of course, right? You need to charge the, the system and there's the, the main harness, the cables and yeah. connectors in between. And so, the display, I think you haven't mentioned that. And of course the display. Now, obviously, what makes Turbo different from any other brands is you don't take these parts off the shelf. Correct, You have, you have yes. to choose all those bits yourself, right? Well, we don't choose them, we actually engineer them. So we're not choosing any of these bits, what we do and how we start a new bike or, or an iteration of a, of a product like this Levo SL. We look at the portfolio of what should we keep for the next platform, like the battery remained the same, what should we change? And then based, based off those decisions, we start designing a new frame around what we have or what we make new. You do make life easy for yourself, do you really? No, it's actually, <laughs> well, it's, no, absolutely not. We, because we want the bike to feel and, and ride like we dream about, and to do that, we, we basically do all the components to our likings. And here we are, seven years later, and you know, many people are kind of emulating the sort of specialized approach with you know, kind of minimalist displays and, and controls. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually super proud of that the industry is adapting to minimal displays and smaller remotes because those are actually making the bike a bike, right? But it must be frustrating at the same time. Well, no, yes and no. I, I'm, in, in a way, yes. On the other hand, it actually proves that what we did was right and the, the riders had a clear like ask for it, so, so people adapt to it. What we need to change now is make it better again. Mark, I don't think we've got the scope to be able to go into each of the system component parts, but let's take two of them as an mm -hmm. example, the motor and the battery. Now, is it true that you know, this unit on the new Levo SL is completely unique to Specialized? Absolutely, yes. So this unit was developed from scratch, like with a white paper approach of trying to understand what do we need to change to make it better. Like, uh, what we looked at is, uh, you know, when you do a motor from scratch, you need to understand what chain line are you using. It's all the silly things like, are you 52 or the new chain line 55? How do you make up for that? For example, like, where do you position it in the frame? How do you mount it to the frame? In what angle do you mount it? With how many mounting points do you mount it? How do you solve for the rock guard? You actually down here see like a little plastic bit we printed of how we attach a rock guard to it. Uh, and, Lutza, also, yeah. and also the sound, right? The, 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 there's a significant sound difference on this motor to the older motor, right? There's, uh, there's things you can do to make the sound feel different. Yes, absolutely. And for example, with Lutza uh, system engineering downstairs, we'll look how many cables do we need to attach to the motor. And we like the simplify approach. Like this engine has only two connectors. One is speed sensor, speed sensor the other one is the, the main power line. So the less connectors, the, the less water ingress, the, the less maintenance. So. Developing an engine from scratch starts really at the white, white page and then we work together with the frame engineers to understand how should it go in the frame, how should it go out of the frame, and how can we make it that it looks actually different. Now, moving on to the battery market, that, right. that in itself must be a headache. I mean, 
if I'm right, this, the, this is the Gen 2 battery. Now, I think this was the first sort of removable down tube battery on an e-bike, right? It was the first removable down tube battery, which would go to the underneath, to the bottom, where we could keep the down tube as, a, as an enclosed object. Basically, we did not have to cut it open, and with that, we could realize lighter, lighter frames. But the big story of this was 700 watt hours, right? The, which is a bit of a game changer at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 700 watt hours at the time was a, a big game changer. So making batteries is even more difficult than, than engines because on a battery you have one component which you cannot change, which is the cell. You know, the cell type is a given. The only thing we can choose is like the 18650 or 21700 cell type. And they kind of define the shape. You, you can put them in different layouts that the battery looks a bit either long and skinny or fat and short. So. There it's actually a bit more complicated to design bikes because we always want to also make bikes for, for shorter people, but also bikes for tall people. The battery is kind of the main driver of how long does the front triangle need to be to, to be able, able to fit the whole battery inside the tube. What makes a turbo a turbo and makes it different to others is that everybody's around the table when we start a new, a new bike. Like we have the system engineers together with the frame engineers together with the mechanical engineers who do the battery, the engine, together with quality and the system integration, all on one table and we talk it through. We talk it, how can we make, how can we create a new benchmark? And that, that makes it special that we have everybody on one table. Yeah, do you know what? I don't think we can get everybody around one table, but I reckon the table I'd like to go to is the coffee tip for a quick cheeky espresso, but then maybe introduce me to some members of the team. Well, let's go downstairs yeah, then. Yeah. Yeah. So Marco, we've got uh, many system component parts there, the battery, the motor, the display, possibly the charger as well. Right. But I mean, how do they all like communicate with each other? Well, they, they, there's a bunch of cables in between them, right? They yeah, need, yeah. To, need to have cables in between and then they communicate on a canvas protocol. The, That's the canvas protocol. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so we adapted this from the automotive industry. Yeah. It's kind of a common protocol how, how these system components communicate. There's the canvas, it has a, a big matrix and that's where Lutza comes into place. She Lutza. is the owner All of right. uh, the communication, but also the battery management. Crikey, right. I guess we need to have a chat with Lutza then first. Yeah, I think we should. Lutza, uh, this Canvas protocol, what on earth is that all about? As Marco already mentioned, it's something which is like originally from automotive, but since our bikes are getting more and more complex and we have more and more units, we need to find a common language how to operate all, all our components and to fine-tune the rider feeling. Basically, they give each other commands. Some are user triggered from your remote, which gives you like your yeah, turbo or micro tune or maybe eco if you want to be eco. And then sometimes it's, for example, the battery asking for some specific commands, but maybe sometimes it's too warm or it's just like not enough capacity so you enter your sag zone. So you're, so you're the person then who's responsible for making a Levo uh, drop a bit of power and it goes to one bar left then, right? But it's important, <laughs> it's important to do that, isn't yeah. it? It's yeah, to so it's, it's exactly like we don't want to compromise safety, so that's the first step with the lithium ion batteries. You have, to, you have to really look and focus on the safety. If you compare it with the automotive, it's fairly simple because it's three components. But yeah, it's just to create very natural feeling of the ride. It's lots of fine tuning. So that's where we use like the canvas protocol, which we can diagnose either stationary here as we have on Marco's bike. So I can see everything what's now like happening on the bike or what we do a lot here in Ham is that we can plug in sort of like this. Uh, Mark, I was going to pick up on what Lutza said there. She had that little dongle thing. Right. So she, like, you know, we joke about, you know, she knows exactly what you do. How much time do you actually spend doing, you know, testing the motors and getting that, that certain feel? Uh, a lot of times. I think it depends a bit on the face of the project, but there's not always, like, internal firmware releases, but they, like, we go, like, monthly. So we have a new firmware, they release it to us internally, we test it, and then if we don't find any issues with it, we keep testing it, validate it for quality. Lots of people ride it, not just me and, and, and the core team, but more people start riding it. We even maybe release it to better riders, so we have some better people in the field. If there's no issues, then finally it goes live into mission control and can be updated. But you do have a nice job, don't you? 
I, I would say I do have a nice job. However, like, and no joke, but I'm coming home stranded quite often, meaning stranded that the bike doesn't work. Especially if we start like a brand new system, like in the early days of DSL, we, we would come back and the bike wouldn't work. Like the bike would die on us. Yeah. We would come back, analyze it, make a new firmware and go back out again. So often you come actually home, maybe not frustrated, but you know it's not there yet and you yeah. need to fix it. So yeah. I guess that, that's an important point. I, I'd like you to introduce me to someone next who, who can talk about that, because you know, as a rider, you don't want to be dying out of the trail. So that comes down to, I think, if we move, now move on to maybe mission control, I think that would be a good uh, natural sort of... Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, mission control allows you, from, from a rider perspective, to see how is your bike doing. You can actually talk to the bike, you can change the bike, you can change some settings, but you can also diagnose the bike. If the bike is healthy yeah. or if it had any error messages where you might want to see either a retailer okay. or take care of it. Okay, cool. Who's the person I do you want to speak to? That would be that? Piotr. Piotr. Let's yes. go and see Piotr then, folks. Hey. Piotr, I just been chatting to Marco. He says I need to chat to you. You're the man in charge of mission control, right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. The bike has a lot of tune options and we have to make sure that it's easy for the rider to actually uh, use it to make the bike exactly what they want it to do. There are a few types of riders. Some riders just want to have the full power all the time and uh, obviously we make it easy, but there are also people that care about range a lot more. So through smart control or some other features, we try to make sure that the range anxiety isn't really there and they can really make sure that the, the bike can be used as long as they want it yeah. to, to last. And in as much as you can tune the motor as you want it, you've also got the, the adjustability on the display. I mean, there's, there's, is, is there like, there's hundreds of, of configurations available, isn't there? Uh, exactly, yeah. You can tune all the, all the display uh, options on, on the TCU and uh, you can make sure that you you show what you want to see there. For me, I have three, three fields on my TCU and it's all time of the day, just to make sure that I'm always uh, home on time and uh, <laughs> that my wife doesn't get upset. Uh, but anyone can take and customize the display exactly to their liking. Yeah, and I guess the third thing is gonna be how the bike, if there's any faults to the bike, can the rider sort of work that out for himself? Yeah, the, the system and the bike, it's a pretty complicated piece of machinery, so Unfortunately, sometimes some things might go wrong, but we make it easy for the rider to actually diagnose and, and find out what's going on with the system. So they don't have to go to retailer the first time some, some glitch happens on the system, but they can try and actually fix it themselves. So you tell me if, if say, a sensor falls off, then it'll tell you that's happened? Exactly, yeah, we have cases of people just losing the, the, the magnet on the, on the wheel, and the system will actually tell you, oh, you probably have something wrong with the with the, mod, with the speed sensor, you can try and actually fix it yourself. Pretty handy then, right? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty handy. Yeah, we just want to make sure that our retailers are not swamped with people going there for, for really small little issues and that the riders can actually do things themselves. Hey Marco, so we've got the system component parts, the motor, battery, right. display, um, got nice plants by the way. I like them too. <laughs> uh, the bit I've been looking forward to talking to you about is the frame and we have got the new Levo SL frame here. Right. So it's fun as having, you know, your great motor, battery, blah, 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 without a frame, geometry, kinematics, shock tune that works. and. You've changed this bike radically in terms of the geometry now. It's gone, it's more slacker, it's lower, quieter. But getting the feel of that bike is, is key, isn't it? It's got, it's got a feel right as yeah, well. Yeah, the, the whole feel of the bike is absolutely key because that what's m makes a difference, right? When you're out riding on the trail, it, it's all about the handling. How does it work together with the, with the components and the integrated system, the motor, the battery, like how, how does it all come together? Yeah, but it's before we go into the system, I'm, I'm guessing you go down system integration route here, but before we do that, folks, I think, I think what's important to understand is, is how a bike feels, the, you know, the kind of the, the compliance of the frame on, on the trail and, and the sizing and, and the geometry. You can, to a degree, you can only get that through experience and you guys are in, in turbo, some of you have been working at Specialized for what, over 20 years? Yeah, for sure. Well, it's both, it's experience and trying. So we usually before we go into a hard molded frame, we try different geometries in what we call mules. So we weld up aluminum frames, which often allow more than one geometry, where you can change geometry on the trail. 
So we take a bunch of tools and, and wrench on, on the bike and try different setups, exactly same day, same trail. That's how you yeah. basically try it. If you do it the other day and you have a different day, it doesn't feel the same. Yeah. Usually it's that. Because you, you guys are obsessed with riding, aren't you? I like, we love, well, I like, we, I like to come back to it. <laughs> we, love, we love mountain bike riding, for sure, yes. Uh, okay, uh, looks to me like we're now going to go into the system integration right. part of the, of the business, right? And, um, well, let me introduce to Nico in this case, yeah. yes. Nico, okay. nice to meet you. Nice uh, to meet you. Congratulations on the Grand Slam, by the way. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Uh, Nico, system integration, you know, getting the motor, the battery, the display, that must come with its challenges, right? Absolutely. Um, it's really how you fit everything together, especially on small sizes bikes, where your front triangle becomes really busy with shocks, water bottles, and you still need to fit the exact same battery as you would on big sizes. So of course it comes with challenges, especially when you start to build an inline configuration. You have motor and battery. They don't overlap each other, but they are really in line. And the battery is like non-removable, but it's like really compact, lightweight, and held by two screws. So having that, that must be a really accurate fit there. And I guess the other part of this story is the fact that Gen 1 Levo SL to Gen 2 Levo SL, the frame is a different shape, the motor is different. You've got to go, you got to start all over again, right? Yes, yes. Actually, the motor is completely different from the internals, but it shares the same mounting points. So that was way easier for us to go with the frame construction because we know where we are going. Um, it's also way easier to force in the testing and so on. And we control really the full interface. So of course we have like the manufacturer that helps us to develop the hardware, but we control the interface for the motor, for the battery, the display, everything together. Yeah. Out of interest, Nico, are you an SL man or a, or a full Levo man? I'm an SL man, ah, fully convinced. Right. Cool. Hey, thanks for your time, Nico. You're welcome. Well, Steve, you know how we both talked about how to make great bikes and which ride great but look great and uh, everything basically lands and falls with the frame and uh, I want you to introduce to a friend, meet Vincent, who has been behind most of the Levo frames as uh -huh. the frame engineering lead, is now leading the engineering okay. team. Okay, Vincent or Vincent? Vincent. Vincent. Vincent is good too. <laughs> I guess, Vincent, the question is, how on earth do you get a Levo SL to feel like a stump jumper? I mean, it all starts with uh, our global objectives. We have uh, a team in California uh, called Ride Dynamics that is setting up our, let's say, our targets for how the bike should feel, how, in a general way, a specialized bike should feel from a suspension, fit, geometry uh, standpoint. Um, and those targets are set uh, regardless of the, uh, of the application. We know that we want a Stump Jumper Evo to feel this way, a Levo SL to feel this way. Um, so we have clear uh, understandings of what um, you know, our power kickback target should be, what range we should hit, uh, and then our work here uh, in CARM starts as to how we're going to apply that filter uh, on the development of, in this case, the Levo SL. Is the solar specialized now here in Switzerland rather than Morgan Hill? Actually, what I just said is, uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite the opposite in the sense that when it comes to the feel of the bike, uh, the soul, the soul of the bike, and uh, how we should feel to the rider is actually developing uh, California. And what we do here is understanding how to achieve uh, that feel um, in the realm of designing an e-bike, actually. You recognize that, Steve? <laughs> I do. I do recognize that. Um, oh, what is it? Steve, while you're thinking about that, let me introduce you to John. John is? Working on future innovations. Ah, the future future, finally. Oh, it's going to come to me, that is. But uh, <laughs> that accent's not from Switzerland, is it? No, you're right. It's a uh, British accent. I'm from uh, Bristol, so near you guys. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, future innovations then, John. What, uh, what are we talking here? Uh, so yeah, we developed the um, things for the, the head units you might have seen on the bike yep, you're riding. Yeah. 
Um, and I think that's something that makes us unique, being able to actually change the firmware and change them on the bench like I'm doing here, as well as on the bikes. So you can pretend um, you've got a bike? Yeah, exactly. I can make it think it's charging, make it change the speed, so see what happens when, uh, when the bike's uh, parameters change on the, you know, when you're actually riding. But. So I guess uh, we're talking things like, uh, you work on things like um, Microtune. By the way, I love Microtune. Um, cool. Uh, the lock feature, which was launched back in, I think it was launched in uh, April, May time, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. And of course, the, the new jump uh, yeah, feature. Yeah, that was recently released too. Um, helped develop that one. That was a, one of the more fun things to develop, obviously. Yeah. A lot of time spent in a pump track. Great. Um, that noise, folks, I think I know what the noise is. The noise is the 10 <laughs> second uh, reminder at the start of, <laughs> of downhill races. Yeah, you got it, it yeah. Yeah. Is that going to be a feature? Of yeah, Libra? me and Mark were chatting one day, like how cool it would be to have that as a thing when you turn the bike on. You know, like riders ready, watch the gate. Uh, you know, I'm <laughs> shuddering just thinking about that start gate. Oh, right, <laughs> I need to move on. Marco, thanks so much for giving us an insight into what goes into the Levo SL. What a place. I saw the Welsh flag, saw French, Italian, Spanish. A guy from Bristol. It's uh, pretty, from all over the world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're attracting quite, quite some uh, characters all around the world. But this is basically, this is just, you only saw one little bit of it. We're, we're totally global. I need to take you on a world tour and we go see our offices in, in different countries. Well, too. I've been to Morgan Hill. Yeah, but, <laughs> but what, so there's Morgan Hill and there's, there's Ham, Switzerland, but there's way more to it, right? We're, we have global offices for engineering and development. We have one more in Germany. Mm -hmm. We have one in Boulder. We have a huge one in Taiwan. So we, we actually are a quite international setup. Wow. What I'm quite surprised about, uh, Marco, is, is one word I thought we'd come across today, and that's the word ecosystem, because we've seen all those people that work here. We've seen the new component, system component parts of Levo SL, you know, the, mo the motor, the new geometry, the new sizing. Right. Um, but yeah, it's a, that's another part of the story, which makes Turbo so special, right? Well, that's the magic. The magic is having the right people on a, on a product development, which is clear goals, with a clear requirement, and then you have the right ecosystem, as you call it. But guys, let's know your thoughts on the new Levo SL, but more than that, uh, what goes into the whole business of making this bike uh, well, around the world. Thanks for joining us from Ham in Switzerland. Guys, Thank thanks you. so much Thank for, for getting us, joining us that insight. You're welcome. Thanks.